All right, so yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk today about S script and its memory hardness. And this talk has been really seen as a continuation of uh, Jeremiah's talk, uh, in the sense that I'm going to tell you the other half of the story uh, about memory hard functions. And in particular, I talk about data dependent memory hard functions, and to which S script is one example. So, and I should mention this is a joint work with a set of amazing co authors uh, Joel Alvin, my PhD student, Vinny Chen. Uh, Cesto Piacek and Leo uh, Rezin. Uh, Leo and Joel are also in the audience. Uh, you can also certainly ask them questions about it. So I don't need to introduce the concept of a memory hard function anymore. So in particular, um, uh, Jeremiah has introduced the notion. And uh, let me just do one thing here. I have a problem with the screen. All right. So uh, I don't need to introduce the notion anymore uh, here. But for those of you that missed the talk or just came in, uh, just think of them as uh, moderately hard hash functions to be used in the context of password hashing or key derivation or proofs of work, where moderate hardness is in terms of both time and, most importantly, uh, memory consumption. And uh, there have been numerous practical designs that have been just mentioned uh, that targeted memory hardness, like Script and Argon2D, Argon2I, Cateno, balloon hashing, and many more. But the focus of this talk is going to be on provable security once again. So in particular, um, provable security has been very effective in uh, validating real-world cryptography because it helps us in gaining extra confidence, in particular against those attacks that we cannot envision yet. But somehow, in the context of memory hard functions and uh, the password hashing competition, where many of such designs have been proposed, uh, things went a little bit differently, mostly because we were lacking appropriate theory at that point in time, or at least that's my assumption. And uh, validation there has mostly occurred in terms of cryptanalysis and often enough intuition. And as you have just seen, there is now better and better theory uh, to validate uh, memory hard functions. But we're still somewhat on a quest to find practical design that are also provably memory hard in the strongest possible sense. So and if you want to close this gap, of course, there's two things you might try to do. So one of them is what was advocated in the previous talk. So we have a well-defined theoretical framework uh, to design provably secure memory hard functions. And uh, we want to find those that are practical enough in this framework. And that can be deployed. But another alternative, which is what we do in this work, is that you can look around for designs that exist already in practice, but uh, that are out of reach for current techniques. Uh, but they resist attacks and maybe try to come up with a valid theory that uh, proves them secure and uh, memory hard. And this is exactly what we did in this work. And we targeted S script. And the main message here is positive. So uh, we provide a proof that the S script function is optimally memory hard, or ideally memory hard, using the language from the previous talk. And this is particularly surprising at first because, well, S script was the very first uh, candidate memory hard function. It was introduced by Colin Percival in the very same paper in 2009 that introduced the notion of memory hard functions as we know it now. Uh, it has found usage, so it is the object of a recently published uh, RFC. Uh, it is also used within cryptocurrencies for proofs of work. It's using Litecoin and other uh, lesser cryptocurrencies. And also, uh, it inspires other designs. So you can find ideas from S script, for example, in Argon2D, one of the two winners of the password hashing competition. And let me stress really that, um, I mean, this is interesting in practice, but also from a theoretical standpoint, uh, this is the first example of uh, memory hard functions that we can prove optimally memory hard. So even in theory, not just in practice. So le let me put this a little bit in the context of the previous talk. A lot has been said already. So I guess the main point here is that uh, we distinguish uh, between um, memory hard functions that are data dependent and data independent, right? So data independent ones are those where the memory access patterns uh, during the execution can depend on the input, whereas uh, cannot depend on the input, whereas for data dependent, they can depend on the input. And script, like Argon2D, is an example of a data dependent one. So, so far, um, the theory has been really focusing on uh, data independent designs. Now, sure enough, one reason is they have some attractive features that I'm going to talk a little bit more later, uh, resistance to side channels, if you're concerned about that. Uh, but uh, a major point is also that from a theory standpoint, there's a much cleaner connection to graph pebblings that Jeremiah has just illustrated that makes proving things much easier. On the other hand, even though we, just, yeah, we have this framework in place, coming up with practical designs, uh, as you can see, is work in progress, right? And we have, uh, even though this is the object of some controversy, but we have attacks now that definitely show that there are structural weaknesses in practical designs that, that we already have. 
On the other hand, on the data dependent side of things, um, there's quite a lot we don't understand. So we have designs around like Script and Argon 2D that seem to resist non -trivial uh, uh, any non-trivial attack and speed up. On the other hand, we have absolutely no theory uh, to understand why that's the case and they seem much harder to tackle. And so that's exactly what we were concerned with here. So a little bit more concretely, uh, what we target uh, in, uh, when I say we analyze Script, we actually target an analysis of what is called Romix, which is the core of the Script function. And um, it's, a, it's a hash function, which is a mode of operation for a simpler hash function, which is not quite a hash function in the usual sense. It's uh, built out of salsa and it's length preserving. But I'm going to abstract uh, the, this as a, just a hash function h. And the structure is very simple. So it starts with a simple uh, iteration of a hash function, of the hash function h. So you have an input, m. It's going to become your first state x0. Then you iterate the hash function to get n values x0 up to xn minus 1. And then you apply the hash function once more to get what is the initial state of the second stage. Um, the second stage is where the interesting things happen that uh, ensure memory hardness. Uh, in particular, we start by looking at the initial state as 0. Maybe you can't read it from far. It's a little bit small. But uh, what you do is you now want to derive uh, an integer between one, 0 and n minus 1 from the state as 0. You can do that, for example, by interpreting as 0 as an integer and then reducing it mod n. And you interpret this as an index which points to one of the n values x0 to xn minus 1. Say it points to 1. So you're going to take that value, and now you're going to XOR it into the state, apply the hash function again, and then you get the next state. And so you can go on like this. So you're going to do the same thing to the next state, derive an index, say this case by accident is the last one, take that value, extra it into the state, and go on and on until you get the final output. Now you have some parameter n here. Um, there's no clear discussion, I think, what are the right parameters for script. I think suggestion I've seen are things like n is equal to 2 to the 14. Uh, w, which will be the length of the hashes, so the size of the state, uh, should be something like 1 kilobyte or larger. But I think by today's standards, you might even want to have uh, larger parameters. All right, so we want to analyze this. We want to prove with memory hard. What that means is that we would like to prove a lower bound on the cumulative memory complexity uh, that was already introduced in the previous talk. So informally, what it means is that we want to show that for every adverse or even parallel ones, if we take the integral of this curve, so we look at the memory consumption at every point in time, and uh, we sum them up, we want to show that this is uh, large enough. Okay. And uh, this is a uh, lower bound uh, for uh, another metric which is less appropriate uh, since it's less uh, resilient to amortization, which is the ST complexity, which just looks at the maximum memory consumption times uh, the time complexity. So, and we want to prove this, uh, uh, and somehow we are very bad at proving lower bounds, usually in crypto. So uh, what we need to do in this case is, or the usual way out, is that we are going to make some ideal assumption on the underlying hash function H, and we model it as what we call a random oracle. So we model it as a random hash function. And then we just want to prove a lower bound on any parallel adversary that try to evaluate romics in this model. That means we consider some adversary that takes as input a message on which he wants to evaluate the, the function, and then proceeds in steps where in each step, what it can do is it can submit a vector of queries, so multiple parallel queries simultaneously to the random ideal hash function, and also can keep some state uh, for the next step. And then in the next step, the adversary is going to get this state, it's going to get the responses to these queries, and then do this over and over again. And then just output something which ideally should be, uh, if the adversary is correct, for evaluating this, the function should be the output of the function on input m. Right? And then we want to. Um, consider the cumulative memory complexity of such an adversary, which uh, typically we're going to model the memory size at every step by considering the size of a, of a, of a state as i, and plus we're also going to consider uh, the size of the answers that uh, the adversary gets back from the hash function queries. Uh, this is uh, very generous. Um, the adversary might need more memory, but we're going to prove a positive result, a lower bound. So it doesn't matter if the adversary uses even more memory, then that's better for us. OK, so if we think about this metric now, and we want to evaluate uh, Romix, now there are two naive approaches that uh, you could take to evaluate the function. Okay? So the first one is you can just consider a naive sequential evaluation, which is what you will do when you run your function on your computer, which is you simply compute the values in the first phase and store them into memory. And then when you get into the second phase, what you're going to do is you're just going to take them from memory whenever you need them, 
and they are going to be there. And hence, you can compute through the entire thing in linear time in a parameter n. And the amount of memory that you need, well, it's as much memory as you need to store these n values that are w bit large. So if you think now about our cumulative memory complexity, you have a linear number of steps. You can store up to n times w bits. So the cumulative memory complexity is going to be n squared times w bits. Right, roughly. I'm omitting constants here, OK? Now, the other alternative strategy is that you say, well, I don't want to waste any memory now, and I want to do this with almost memory less. So what you could do here instead is say, OK, I'm just going through the chain at the beginning and don't remember anything, get to the initial state of the second phase, and now see which value I actually need. Say, for example, now I see, oh, from my S0, I need the value x1. So now I'm going to recompute it, starting from x0, and I'm going to get that value and then add it into the state and then forget it and go on. And then see what's the next value. I'm going to recompute it and then just add it to the state and go on. Now, this recomputation, recomputing can be expensive because we might have to do up to linear work to go through the chain again. So on average, say n over two steps. Okay, so overall, we make n square steps. And however, the memory we keep is very small. So if the order of w bits, where w is the size of the state. Remember, so again, the cumulative memory complexity is something like n squared times w. Okay, so now we can start making some conjectures, which is what people have conjectured for long, which is that we have two extreme strategies, one remembering everything sequential, the other one, other one memoryless. So we could conjecture that now every other strategy might be at least as bad, right? But of course, they're just a conjecture, and we really have no a yeah, priori, we wouldn't have no evidence, right? It could be that the real thing is like this, okay? So maybe there are some strategies that are much better than n squared times w. Okay, I know the plot is a little bit absurd, but it was kind of a theory talk, so I thought I should put some plot just to make it more real worthy, I guess. All right, so, so is the conjecture true or not? And uh, so that's exactly what we confirmed. So we confirmed that the conjecture is true, at least up to some multiplicative factor. So what we show is that roughly, for every possible adversarial strategy that wants to evaluate uh, Romix, its uh, cumulative memory complexity is going to be, well, roughly n squared times w times a constant, which is 1 over 25 and could be up for optimization in our proof. And uh, also note that we don't quite get n squared times w, we get n squared times w minus uh, some uh, difference, which is 4 times log n, where n is the parameter that gives you the number of iteration. Um, this is somewhat inherent uh, in our proof technique. So there is a small loss even there, even if you optimize the, co the, the constant in front. So we really can't get rid of it. But note that it's not a big problem um, if you're concerned about a concrete parameter, especially because typically w is quite huge, something like 1 kilobyte at least. And log n should be at most 14, so you should not really be concerned too much about that uh, for log n. Okay? Also note that despite the simplicity of this result, this is really not uh, something easy to get. There have been numerous, uh, well numerous, at least a few attempts uh, to prove this result in the past. Uh, for those of you who actually read Colin Percival's paper, I assume many of you, uh, introducing S-Script, there is actually a proof there of memory harness for, for S-Script. And uh, it turns out, I mean, I'm not gonna go into it, we have more evidence, uh, more evidence to it in the paper, but uh, it's pretty much folklore by now that the proof is incorrect, so there, there, there is a bug there. Um, and also it targets a, a weaker security property than uh, a weaker uh, harness measure than cumulative memory complexity. And there's also some previous work by myself and a partially overlapping set of co-authors that appeared at Eurocrypt uh, last year where we proved a weaker bound and, uh, for, for S-Crypt. And uh, that's weaker both quantitatively, it's, it, does, it falls short of being optimal, and also it only holds for restricted uh, adversaries. So I'm not going to go into it. Now, the important point here that was already addressed by Jeremiah is that this shows uh, a separation between data-dependent memory heart function and data-independent ones. So by a result by, by Jeremiah and Joel Alvin, uh, we know that for every um, data-independent memory heart function, there exists a strategy that allows you to evaluate it with cumulative complexity, which is roughly n squared times w over log n. Uh, whereas here, we prove something of the other n squared times w, so there is a log n gap that is going to fall away. Of course, we have to be honest here, constants here matter, and a log n and a constant factor might end up being the same for reasonable n's, but at least asymptotically, you see that the difference can be substantial, and you know, with a similar constant, you have to be careful about that, because log n can be very large for reasonable parameters. 
So why is proving something like this so difficult? So the main reason is that we are quite bad at dealing with bounded memory in provable security. And we have to address the fact that an adversary that might evaluate this function arbitrarily, we want to show that it's hard for any possible such adversary, tries to memorize partial information about the execution and could do whatever it likes to do that. And so these states, these intermediate states, could be really arbitrary, and we have to think about that. In the IMHF case, the proof was much simpler somehow because the very nice elegant reduction to graph peddling works. The problem is that this trick really re requires you that the data dependencies in the computation are all known a priori, something which we don't have here. Uh, in fact, the security of something like Romix or Escript or Argon 2D really depends on data dependencies being unpredictable. Otherwise, you cannot get uh, as high security as we get. Uh, the intuition indeed is that the reason why this thing is memory hard is that once you move to the second stage, these indices that you have to go fetch, for which you have to go fetch values from the first phase, are unpredictable until you compute them. And so in order to be ready to proceed fast, you need to have many of these values stored in memory already. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck and need to recompute things. And so that's why the intuition, I just want to give you a four-minute, five-minute intuition about why Escript is memory hard, is to really think about the following game where you're thinking about the evaluation of Romix. Think about uh, having a game between a challenger and an adversary. The adversary learns the initial value x0, can make queries to the random hash function, the random oracle, and now the challenger in the game proceeds in rounds, and on each round gives to the adversary a random challenge, which is an integer between 0 and n minus 1. And the goal of the adversary is to come up with possible using as, 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 less, as, few, mem as few memory bits as possible with the value indexed by that challenge in the initial chain. Okay? So I'm abstracting away completely the second phase of Romix uh, with the idea that it's really about getting these challenges that are unpredictable and going and fetch that particular value. And now the adversary wants to go through all of the challenges and uh, be able to compute. So, in fact, we can make an extra step here just for the purpose of this talk, which is very intuitive, and even model a simpler version of this game where the adversary only remembers, similar to the pebbling case, um, just the values, uh, just values x0 to xn minus 1, or a subset of them. And so we can really think of this also as a special case of a pebbling game, or a variant of a pebbling game, where we look at the line simply, and uh, putting a pebble on a particular node on the line with nodes from 0 to n minus 1 indicates uh, remembering the corresponding value xi if you have a pebble on node i. And then you have the same rule as in the pebbling game we had in the previous talk. And in particular, multiple moves can be done in parallel. So something the adversary could do in trying to evaluate, it will start by putting always a pebble on the first node, then it could add pebbles, it could move pebbles, and always put a pebble next to a pebble which is already there and move in parallel to support parallelism of the, the strategy. Right? And so in particular, the challenge, the, the, the round game with challenges in this setting will simply have now the adversary learning a challenge at every round, say for example here four, and now the goal is to put a pebble on four. For example, now this will be done in four steps if you don't have anything on the line because you have to start by putting a pebble and then move step after step. Let's say you get another challenge, now you have to put more, another pebble, move there into step, but now if you get another challenge on six, now you're lucky, you have a pebble nearby on four, and you can move fairly quickly to six. Right, and you're interested now in seeing what's the complexity of an adversary to go through this game, and in particular, note here that the memory complexity at a particular stage corresponds roughly to the number of pebbles times the number of bits to store a value. And now, we want to lower bound the complexity of any strategy that successfully goes through this game. And again, this is completely arbitrary. The strategy could, be an, could do anything. So it could have different amounts of pebbles at different stage. Uh, whenever it gets a new challenge, it could have a different number and a different subset of pebbles on the line. And it could take different amounts of times to answer that challenge. And so we would like to show that no matter what we do, there's a lower bound which is squared in n for the curve here, which is defined by the red lines. So this is the core of our proof. And the basic idea here is that whenever you have a certain pebbling configuration and you learn a challenge, the time you need to answer that challenge is inversely proportional to the pebbles you have on the line. This is quite natural because if you have a certain set of pebbles, have so much time? Okay. Oh, five. Okay, good. So 
uh, yeah, I think I'm going to be faster. So uh, if you look at the set of pebbles that you have here on the line, uh, that could be anything, say you have P of them, and now you want to see how many um, challenges you could answer within a certain amount of time steps, say two time steps. In fact, we count these as three uh, in, the, in the paper. Uh, then there are only so many challenges, so any challenge that lands into this um, highlighted area could be answered within three steps. Anything else requires more time. And so if you do the math, what you see is that this gives you a very nice probabilistic trade-off where we see that, well, at least with probability one half, the time that you need to answer the challenge, the probability is over the choice of the challenge, is at least n over or larger than n over twice the number of pebbles you have. Or in other words, what that means is that with probability one half, you have a trade-off in the form that the time you need to answer the challenge times the number of pebbles uh, that you have on the line is at least um, n over 2. Right? So this takes us much closer to what we want, but we are not quite there yet. Uh, in particular, what this means, now assuming that this trade-off, just for the simplicity of my explanation to make it simpler, holds for every challenge, what this means is that if we look now at the amount of pebbles that the adversary has on the line every time a new challenge is revealed, and now we look at the rectangles that are defined by taking as a height this number of pebbles, and the width of the rectangle is the time it takes to answer that challenge, then what this trade-off tells us is that the area of these rectangles, of all of them, or at least all of them for which this probabilistic trade-off holds, is at least a linear in n. So if you have n challenges, now it's intuitive to think that the overall area should be n squared. Unfortunately, that's not quite what we need, because we need to look at this curve, which is defined by the amount of pebbles we have at every time, and we have no guarantee that after an adversary learns a challenge, it might just not drop everything it has and just remember, for example, the closest pebble to the challenge and forget about everything else. In fact, for the last challenge, for example, that's the most reasonable thing to do. Everything else will be rather stupid. So, what that means is that the area, which is the blue area here, is n squared, but we need to lower bound the, um, the area, uh, which is defined by the red uh, histograms. Now, I'm not going to go into details how we do this, but the basic idea, and that's one of our two major technical contributions here, is to look not at the area that we have under the curve after the challenge is revealed, but to realize that in order to have a number of pebbles which is fairly high, then we need to put them there. And so there is some work that we need to do. And so what we look at is not at the drop or the behavior of the curve after we learn the challenge, but we use a generalized version of the trade-off to look at what happens before we learn the challenge. The other main challenge, of course, that I haven't talked about is that here I am looking at the simplified version in terms of pebbling. But obviously, we want to deal with adversaries that can store any type of information about uh, the previous um, states of the execution. And that requires some more technical work, which I'm not going to talk about here. But that's very important. Now, I, I have some lengthier conclusions here um, that I want to start going through. So the first one is that I think this is very it's, it's an important result because it's a good example of an interesting theory problem that, however, validates a very practical design. Uh, I just have a quote here from Phil Rogovic's essay on the moral characters of cryptographic work, where, in fact, he motivates this as one of an important line of work uh, to try to understand these modes. Um, but that's not the, one, the only one thing here. Um, so it is really, it, only gives, it gives also a very good example of a practical design uh, with strong provable memory harness guarantees. And uh, also the first one, which is really practical and has such provable guarantees. And also, it's really the first example, even in theory, of an optimal in memory hard uh, MHF. Now, a question you might ask, because I've been focusing on S-Script and Romix, is what about Argon 2D? Um, so Argon 2D, for those of you who are familiar with it, has a very similar design to S-Script. Uh, the main difference being that you don't have such two phases of, um, of execution, but you have a sliding window of values that you're going to use and point back to to insert in the execution. Now, we don't have this written down in the paper. That's why I have a star. But the same technique should easily give the same lower bound. But, uh, so we don't have this in written yet. Okay? Now, another thing that I wanted to say is that, that also came up in the previous talk, 
is about the issue of DMHFs versus IMHFs, so data-dependent memory heart function versus data-independent memory heart function. Um, so at least from, with respect to the goal of achieving um, high and optimal memory harness in a provable sense, so DMHF seems to be easier to get right and also probably achieve higher uh, memory harness, at least in an as asymptotic sense. So the main problem here that you might face, uh, despite the fact that they're also harder to prove, uh, memory heart, but other than that, of course, the main concern are side channels. And uh, this is something that was also mentioned by Jeremiah. Uh, there are a possible concern. Uh, your memory access patterns do depend on the input. And so here, the main point is that you should be really assessing whether in the application you're looking at, you're more concerned about memory harness uh, being strong or whether you're concerned about possible side channels. So there are applications like proofs of work where for sure side channels do not seem relevant at all for password hashing, well, you have to see. But if you're not concerned about that, then there's really no reason why you shouldn't be using uh, data-dependent memory heart functions since the guarantees really seem to be stronger. And uh, finally, just a few words about proofs. Um, so I really think that there's been some debate, also for those of you that follow CFRG, uh, on uh, the role of proofs in the context of memory harness. Uh, I really think they are important. So if you have a mode that has a proof, uh, and is as efficient as one without. I don't think there's any reason to discard the one without, with the proof. Um, and uh, of course, it's not the only thing. There's a lot of interesting questions uh, related to how tight these proofs are and whether the models are the best ones. But still, I think the proof remains an important component. And of course, when I say proofs, I mean you have to target concrete security and be as concrete as possible, especially in this domain where speeding up things by a constant factor really matter and makes an impact, you have to really work and make an effort into having bounds that are as tight as possible. Okay, so that's actually everything I wanted to say. So there's a paper on ePrint uh, on, about the results, so feel free to have a look. A uh, quick question. So there, there was a constant in front of your bound, right? So does that give any inspiration for a new attack? That would be a, a small constant factor speed up? I don't think this is really tight. I mean, uh, if ah. there are many ways of uh, like relaxing things in the proof that might make, might make things a little bit better. Um, so for example, uh, yeah, just requiring that the usage of memory is slightly higher throughout the proof. So it's, it's not clear, really. And there's some work there that should be done and try to tightened enough. So I don't think 1 over 25 is, is the final answer.